सो इन लास्ट फोर सेशंस वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग अबाउट बेसिक फीचर्स ऑफ इंडियन इकोनॉमिक फाइनेंशियल मॉडल व्हिच हैज मोर और लेस कवर्ड द होल ओवरव्यू ऑफ द होल कोर्स स्पेशली इन द लास्ट टू सेशंस वी वर डिस्कसिंग सम यूनिक फीचर्स ऑफ इंडियन इकोनॉमी बिकॉज एक हो गया फिलोसॉफिकल पार्ट क्योंकि कैपिटलिज्म है ये कम्युनिज्म है एंड यू हैव यू नीड एन अल्टरनेट मॉडल द क्वेश्चन इज वेदर इट रियली एग्जिस्ट सो एटलीस्ट सम पार्ट्स ऑफ इट और सम फीचर्स ऑफ इट आर देयर एज ऑफ नाउ एंड दे आर बीइंग फॉलोड दैट वाज डिस्कस्ड इन द लास्ट टू सेशंस पर्टिकुलरली व्हाट डिड वी डिस्कस इन द लास्ट सेशन फोर्थ सेशन एक्चुअली वो पहले हो गया था बट ओके ठीक है यूनिक फीचर्स में एक डेमोग्राफिक डिविडेंड आगे हाँ क्लस्टर्स एकदम एंड में किया उसके बीच में सोशल कैपिटल वगैरह वो भी एक्चुअली थर्ड सेशन में हो गया था परफेक्टली सो अप टिल एक्सेप्ट लास्ट टू फिफ्टी और थ्री हंड्रेड इयर्स इंडिया वाज ऑलवेज द लीडर क्लोजली फॉलोड बाय चाइना एंड व्हाट चार्ट वी सॉ वाज प्रोड्यू प्रिपेयर्ड बाय हुम एंगस मेडिसिन इट वाज बेस्ड ऑन स्टडी बाय एंगस मेडिसिन Today we will see much more collaborative evidence. ऐसा नहीं कि we are only making argument based on one study. There are several other studies, but that one study is a very long term study, two thousand years. So that we saw in short, which shows that there exists a civilization which has a very long prosperous history of sustainable prosperity. We had discussed about entrepreneurship as a whole so entrepreneurship is one of the unique features of indian mindset not so apparent in the educated class more seen in the less educated or uneducated people of course slowly it is also coming in the educated class but it gets reflected in the percentage of uh, population involved in business activities How much is a percentage in India? It is 18 percent, one of the highest, especially highest in the large economies. And that also gets reflected when Indians go abroad. They do lot of businesses inside India. Educated people don't so much go for business, but still, if you look at the overall economy, people are generally very innovative. They keep on finding solutions. हाँ कई बार ये होता है कि पूरा स्ट्रक्चर अगर करप्टेड है इट डजेंट गिव यू मेनी अपॉर्चुनिटीज यू विल फाइंड इनोवेटिव सोल्यूशन इन अ रॉन्ग एंगल टू सब आइर बाईपास द लॉ और डू सम अदर थिंग स्ट्रक्चर इज गुड द गुड सोल्यूशन में कम फॉर न्यू टेक्नोलॉजी एंड गुड थिंग्स ओके एंड फ्रॉम दैट वी ऑल्सो डिस्कस्ड हाउ देर आर लार्ज नंबर ऑफ स्मॉल बिजनेसेस so where are they located small businesses mostly in business clusters and how have the clusters grown largely organically by why i ask this question because in western countries also there are business clusters but generally they are grown by support of the government or through some policy action india may be policy action hua hai governments do have industrial parks and such things but many times we find that those industrial parks are empty but organically grown uh, clusters are thriving they are doing lot of business attracting new uh, businesses etc and many of them are actually community driven so some people in the community start business then they invite others then the good part of business is dominated by one community it does not remain only with one caste then other caste people also join then they also join in more number like that it grows on but promotion generally happens through known people 
so it is not that you will see the advertisement of the industrial park and some conditions would be there and suddenly you will apply and people will come and join as a hona chahiye in formal setup here it doesn't so much happen it more happens because somebody known to you tells ki isme opportunity hai then some youngster join uska aur ek friend join karta hai uska aur ek relative join karta hai and slowly 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 those clusters grow especially in our last two chapters of our book 7 and 8 we will discuss more on clusters because that is indian business model and indian management model yeah. any other feature we had seen okay most of the features i think we have discussed now now we would like to go Uh, in next generally i think it will take two sessions there is lot of data it can go on for 8 10 sessions but i want to not go beyond two sessions that is about ancient indian economy so jo economic history wala part hai which we have discussed in the context of the uh, data presented by angus medicine but we would also like to see other corroborative evidence so there are three ppts this is the main ppt which talks about was there so much of prosperous economy in india which westerners don't believe until recently they used to say that you have nothing to offer on economic front up to say 1930s wagera wo bolte the ki you have nothing to offer at all later on they accepted that okay you have something like yoga or ayurved or spirituality but you can't have anything on economic forum because you are a very poor country but more and more data of last 30 40 years or 44 years means old data but being researched and published in last 30 40 years is providing evidence of lot of prosperity in the ancient india we'll just see a few things this we have already seen this is the first part of it that is as of 00 India was much much ahead of all other countries almost 32.9 almost 33% of world gdp contributed by india this is angus medicine study which we have seen already last time and i think i have also told you that this is very much on lower side don't feel ki ye bahut overstate kiya hai in fact per capita data he has assumed it on less than western europe which personally i don't agree at all but i have not tampered the figures whatever he has given is based on a low per capita income of india uske bawajood bhi the figures are high because there is high population in india high population itself signifies prosperity and stable life in those days because otherwise people will not live or their population won't grow unless there is there are good prospects in that uh, country so superior economic performance from gdp we can al always see then there were high level of skills and talented people which we will see now well developed economic status and high performance on different sectors this is one more study presented by this michael milken he has compared economic output of 1820 more from a us angle now we'll look at each of the sectors because if gdp is high it cannot suddenly come by magic it should be supported by uh, agriculture that is primary sector industry as well as the service sector and also slightly on other critical sectors because if your economy is good it should also have good education and good science and technology otherwise it may mean that there is other figures are now you are adjusting so we have tried to cover these five aspects in this ppt obviously in those days uh, technology was not comparable to today's technology so agriculture was the main occupation but the impression which britishers give that 90% was contributed by agriculture was not true it was after britishers looted us prior to that there was good amount of contribution from uh, trade manufacturing as well as other services it was mostly village based and villages were largely सेल्फ सब्सटेन ये तो हमेशा बताया जाता है कि सच्चा भारत गांव में रहता है वगैरह वगैरह विच रीडिंग वी फील दैट बहुत ही प्रिमेटिव रहेगा टेक्नोलॉजी कुछ भी नहीं रहेगी दैट्स नॉट ट्रू टेक्नोलॉजी वॉज देयर 
it was self sustaining means people had everything but the most of those things could be prepared from the local resources that type of technology was available today also as we have seen our culture talks about decentralization iske liye decentralized manufacturing hota tha jaise for example we need clothes so textile manufacturing was there it was done in a very small tiny townships near those villages or in some cases in the village that's why it was self sustaining villages there are also good amount of well developed cities so excavation in uh, harappa and mohenjo daro showed good cities but there were hundreds of such cities everywhere which were industrial and trade centers then agricultural of course supplied raw materials there was fine balance between the centers and there was also a scientific system for managing governance and the uh, for government as well as managing the economy so the most old of course the profession would be uh, agriculture and the food production so have you heard of this bheem betka this is in madhya pradesh this is as old as 1 lakh years old uh, cave paintings to so just cave paintings hai aisa nahi hai of course there are cave paintings those cave paintings also show various types of equipments made of stone but equipments existed of different types which are there in those cave paintings even in those days and there are also shivaliks and potwar now in pakistan that shows various types of fossil remains and uh, paleolithic tools which were used even in those days why i am showing this because generally western scholars always used to put that prior to 3000 bc there can be no culture so just jada se jada limit was 3000 bc then they said 4000 then they said 5000 till recently they used to maximum put it at 6000 bc but now they are getting lot of old uh, things which are as old as 1 lakh years if you look at our shastras it talks about lakhs of years of history at the, in those times i mean it's very difficult to get actually the material things as old at that but you can get bones human bones which you are getting now because other things will get destroyed and they can't be dated then more recent this is the jean francois a uh, french excavator so there is one more site called as mehergad which has ancient settlements as well as agricultural economy then this randhwa uh, which has talked about cultivation of wheat barley peas date farms and cotton of which cotton is really very unique because this is 4500 years ago so generally outside india wearing clothes was hardly known till 3000 years before like because cotton ka direct use kuch nahi hai unless you have the technology to convert it into textile so that existed then only you will grow the cotton otherwise there is no point in growing the cotton this is one more this is about cultivation of rice and one more thing that cotton cloth discovered in harappa Uh, then this greek his greek historian megasthenes has also net, noted that this is also very important that great part of soil was under irrigation so the, he is talking about 1500 bc almost at that time itself good part of soil particularly in south india because north india may perennial rivers hai but south india there is no water source unless you have facilities of irrigation then this study is about fertility of land and production of different varieties and uh, general alexander walker he was with east india this is much recent and he has said that hindus had developed superior tools and techniques in agriculture drill plow was hardly known in europe till 1662 but it was used in india for a very very long time then this compost and organic manure was also used so this albert horvard has said that indian farmers are professors and they decide that he could not do better but to watch their operations because if you want to do agriculture for thousands of years the fertility of land will go down 
which is now happening in US and other parts. But in India, it was not happening perhaps that was because of use of compost and other organic material. This is the South India part which we were talking of. This is much recent. In 1850s, the survey done by Britishers show that there were 50,000 tanks or lakes. The whole of South India was rotted with tanks. Uh, 18th century, there were more than 38,000. Uh, recently, they have slowly gone down. But in the ancient times, there were very large number of lakes and water bodies, which were human-made water bodies. Okay, the second uh, pillar of economy is industry. So, on industry also, there are number of uh, evidences. So, one is by Chabra about shipbuilding industry, which was very old. Uh, have you heard of Lothal? So, Harappa ke time, same time, there is a uh, place called Lothal in Gujarat. And that has a very, very large platform for shipbuilding, even large by today's standards. So, shipbuilding, breaking, whatever, all the marine related activities. Uh, this is a very good book, The Wonder That Was India by Basham. He is a European person who has written a lot about uh, ancient Indian uh, industry. Uh, about 2000 years, 2300 years ago, he has noted various industries during Mauryan Empire. Then Kennedy has presented that in 1750, one fourth of global output was coming from India. So, this is a supportive evidence for that GDP figures. So, 1750, the ma out of global manufacturing activity, 24.5% was contributed by India and only 182 by the West. Whole of Europe plus US counted. Did I spoke about Paul Bayrock? He is a person, a Belgian. He has also done a very detailed study like Angus Medicine before that. So, he has this book, International Industrializations Level from 1752. A uh, book, nahi, journal paper, hai, 1750 to 1980. He is, this is published, I think, in 86 or something. And he has given in details, especially has studied industrialization and urbanization. He has not studied the whole economy, but these two show the developed status of the economy. Yeah, this is one more book by uh, Bayrock with Levy Labor on disparities in industrial uh, economic development since industrial uh, revolution. Yeah, this is one more person, Kennedy Paul, who has given the relative share of world manufacturing output. Again, almost the same figures. Ha, a very important point, ki consumption ka hao ta ta. The large part of consumption was of course exported. India ka population 24% nahi hai. 24% is a manufacturing share of India. I think more than 50% was exported, though I have not put this data here, but a large part was exported. Partly it will come in labor, uh, trade. Uh, one important was textile. Textile was hardly known outside India, but very, very good in India and to an extent in China. Second was also various type of equipments made of iron. Because smelting industry, manufacturing of various types of metals was very well known in India and India used to export all metal products, finished products of metal. Europe mein European art hogi, yahan se log itna lenge ne. And uh, transport was very costly. So unless you really contribute, I mean there is lot of value addition, there may not be, it may not be worth to really ship from here to there. Spices and paper to hai, wo agriculture mein aa hai. Our history books only talk that India used to export spices. They say ki spices export karke itna, spices se kya, kya, how much would be the consumption of spices? It was negligible. It was there. It was unique in a sense. Manufacturing of spices was only made in India, not there outside. Iske liye bohut saare logo ne likha hai ki haan, India se spices aate te. But we should not assume that they contribute to a very large part of export. Because book mein sirf spices padke logo ko sabko lagta hai ki sirf spices hi export hote de. I don't know exact percentage, but I think it was not very big. Large part was textile and 
various types of metal items including equipments uh, various items which are used for war etc but export trade kafi milta hai if we go to maritime data export trade kafi milta hai uh, to the best of my knowledge agricultural items won't be exported they would be all internal consumption but industrial items because industry was mainly concentrated in india and partly in china they used to be exported uh, next important activity was trade and it was extended to many other countries through both sea as well as the land routes and yahan pe to cotton textile and paper rikha hai and massive favorable balance of trade this you can find because there is some data about payment of i mean movement of gold to india because at that time settlement of bop would always happen only through gold and in some cases through silver because koi global currency to hai nahi ki which can settle so if one country is exporting the other country will have to pay in the form of gold either settle it by their items but that was not happening much because india already had good agriculture and industry so you see the data of gold coming to india that was basically the settlement of those bop surpluses there is a separate paper on this shipping industry known as indian maritime trade i'll share that paper with you it gives details about the different types of ships that were made how many ships were there all over the world etc but it shows that it was quite strong the other industry i mean industry or services as whatever you call is finance so banking and finance was also reasonably well developed so in another ppt i have discussed like kundis which were there and there was no taboo on lending activity unlike in islamic countries where lending was not allowed here lending was extensively done both short term medium term as well as long term in fact now one of the cp groups is studying on the lending activity in medieval india uh, you see a short term like one season credit just for 6 months wagera till you get the crop then medium term and sometimes even long term long like term 50 years nahi but 10 15 years kind of uh, credit being provided and there is some uh, data about governance which talks about the annual revenues of aurangzeb that amounted to almost 10 times that of louis at the same time they were contemporary yeah now we will see other two aspects uh, which are education and science and technology because any developed country would have developed education system also and vice versa developed education system would lead to a developed civilization so indian education system was very much strong significantly destroyed by british which we will see later on so uh, you would be knowing that in the life as per our ancient system we used to have four phases four ashramas what were they anybody knows ye to idhar likha hai brahmacharya ashram grahastha ashram vanaprastha ashram sanyashram ashram so if you have 100 years of life 25 years were supposed to be for education which would be norm today but remember it's 10000 years before also uh, such a significant part so you can take or rather you are recommended to take education up to one fourth of your education which is very heavy ekdam primitive societies mein aise hoga ki after 12 13 years you start gathering food because hardly any society is developed in many other parts of the world but here it was specifically provided that to one fourth part you be brahmachari and do your education life period kitna tha we don't know but it is said that it was very long but if you assume it's 100 still it was then you have got uh, documented takshashila you have heard about about 2700 years ago and that had 10500 students and about 60 different subjects or faculties which are listed and there were several other universities यहाँ पे भी हिस्ट्री बुक में सिर्फ नालंदा और तक्षशिला ही रहता है बट देर वेर लार्ज नंबर एटलीस्ट हंड्रेड ऑफ यूनिवर्सिटीज लोकेटेड ऑलमोस्ट ऑल पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया दीज वेर आई मीन दे आर देर इन द टेक्स बुक बिकॉज उनके 
रिमेनिंग पार्ट मिले नाइनटीन सिक्सटीज में वगैरह नाउ एक्सकवेशन एट अदर प्लेसेस यू आर फाइंडिंग अदर लोकेशन ऑल्सो वेयर सम स्टडी सेंटर्स वेयर देयर सेकेंडली इंडिया बींग ह्यूजली पॉप्युलेटेड कंट्री कई सारे पार्ट्स तो चले भी गए बिकॉज नाउ न्यू बिल्डिंग्स एंड ऑल अदर थिंग वुड हैव कम यू इट्स नॉट लाइक अ डेजर्ट वेयर देर वुड बी नो पॉप्युलेशन सो एंशंट सेंटर्स ऑफ लर्निंग नाउ न्यू सेंटर्स ऑफ लर्निंग और सम अदर मंदिर सम अदर पॉप्युलेशन वुड हैव ऑलरेडी कम अप बट स्टिल यू फाइंड लॉट ऑफ रिकॉर्ड्स लिटरेसी वॉज रेट वॉज वेरी हाई एग्जैक्टली कितना है पता नहीं बट इट शुड बी क्लोज टू एटी नाइनटी परसेंट बाय वी गॉट the freedom it had come down to 30% we will see how i mean wh- what are the evidence for it and education was very much widespread it was there almost in all communities so later on british spread ki nahi dalitos ko education nahi hai inko education nahi hai backward class hai etc but if you see the british records in 1750s you will realize that education was there almost for all the communities uh, further centers this is basically from there is a good paper by aict that's why i have given link also they have talked about this odantapuri uh, especially from gupta period then there is nagarjun konda sharda peet then kanchipuram and in sri lanka also some uh, university centers are mentioned a lot has been documented especially about takshashila so there were large number of monasteries we have already seen 10500 ke close students rehte the uh, there are no big lecture halls perhaps most of the education was in small groups or individually and uh, it is described in jatak tales in sri lanka etc and it used to attract students from almost all over the world that is also mentioned then these are the famous students of the university chanakya then chandragupta and also ayurved healer charak these are some of the well known alumni uh, entry age is generally 16 that shows that for primary and whatever suppose 10th standard type of education of today there used to be lot of schools around those students will not be entertained here this is specially for higher education so vedas and 18 arts were particularly taught and they have been mentioned including law medicine and military sciences another well documented is a uh, school uh, i mean university is in nalanda bihar again it used to have all the faculties yahan pe iske kuch details available hai and now they are found also there were 10 temples meditation halls classrooms lakes parks here some big classrooms are also found where you have big halls uh very important part was there was a nine story building for library in those days and 9 million manuscripts were kept there because at that time printing was not there so everybody had to write down whatever the books required this had accommodation for 10000 students and 2000 professors and there is a mention of uh, various parts from where people used to come and study particularly most of the asian countries and persia and turkey that's what is mentioned uh, 12th century there is a mention of bakhtiyar khilji who actually sacked the university he burnt the whole of library and almost killed all the students as well as the professors because generally we find that hardly any records are found in india the reason is this because most of the places of learning were destroyed and i mean anything written by on paper can be easily burned so most of the papers were burned people were killed ki jo kanthastha karte the who will remember those shastras they were generally killed that's why you don't find much of the documented evidence you have to rely on some magasthenes or some chinese person who would have just seen some parts to give us some details most of the local details are destroyed here also you find some details in sri lanka about the nalanda university then there was one more paper where many other centers are mentioned uh, this varanasi we know kanchipuram telhara in bihar which they have said that's probably older than nalanda odantapuri we have already seen sompura nagarjun konda one more valabhi in gujarat then manya kheta i don't know what it is in karnataka lot is also written about this pushpagiri in odisha and three centers in sri lanka 
and the academy of gundishapur in ancient persia so in those days persia was very much a part of indian culture so now excavations in persia are showing lot of temples and such places in this gundishapur so when britishers arrived they have done three major surveys so they had three major parts of india so one was done in south india then in kolkata about east india particularly bengal and bihar and one was done for maharashtra and gujarat so they had three presidencies so and they have done survey of education at that time which actually gives lot of details so this is one survey by william adam around 1830s and this is not very 2500 years before wagera nahi hai as early as 1830s he mentioned that almost every village had a school and there is also observation by this let letner in 1882 this is for punjab which also says that almost every village uh, had a school and at that at the same time england had very few schools for ordinary people till about 1800 this is what he has mentioned so by 1800 now india is in foreign rule for almost 600 years so most of the centers of higher learning were destroyed but village schools were quite active and that records are mostly seen in this uh, this surveys done by the britishers so britishers were very shrewd so they were never published you can find in some british libraries or their parliament records when the macaulay's minutes were presented and they were dug out only in 1950s or 60s till that time this was hardly known though they would know it the policy makers would know it so adams record also mentions about 100 institutions of higher learnings and in concluded that in 18 districts there were about 1800 such institutions so though they were destroyed still 1800 centers of higher learning were there village had schools which were numbering in lakhs uh, so ha uh, here that mention is there about people of various castes and religions taking education in those schools or patshalas or madrasas or whatever they are there are good number of girls also enrolled though not 50% 30 40% of the student population was in the form of girl students ha uh, this is the this is from that third report about madras presidency where he has mentioned that the school attendance is pretty high it was proportionately far higher than the numbers of schools in england ha uh, yahan pe ek acha hai ki he has also commented on the contents of the study he says that the contents of the study was much better than that in much superior that than that in england at that time so in this madras presidency report uh, centers of higher learning are placed at 1094 and district wise break up is also given of the uh, centers as well as the number of scholars in those centers so once britishers introduced their new education policy all the village schools were set and few schools were started only in district places now it was very difficult for people to travel and take education that's where we see fall in the literacy rates and also after that there was significant difference caste wise now only people of higher caste can afford the education villages mein aisa kuch nahi tha because one it was decentralized second the education was free so even if the person is very poor at least usko likhne padhne ko basic mathematics that school will teach that went away once the britisher system started uh, in detail you can see this study by dharmpal and the book is called as beautiful tree actually there are 12 volumes all of them are world learning this volume 3 is about education so he has published 12 volumes about different aspects of life in india that's about science and technology now you have so much of industry there has to be it has to be supported by science and technology because unless you have a superior technology people from outside will not buy cost difference utna hona chahiye ki transport cost meet karne ke baad bhi you have something special to offer so generally there are several scientists who have admitted that the foundations of modern science were essentially laid in india particularly this is a very good quote by 
Albert Einstein, where he says that we owe a lot to Indians who taught us how to count, without which no worthwhile scientific discovery would be possible. So I think you would have read the, about this Shunya and I mean numerical system, which Europeans called as Arabic numerals, but they were actually Indian numerals which traveled to them through Arabia. That's why they call them Arabic numerals. And there are several other references of ancient mathematics which was quite well developed. Uh, have you read blog by Professor Ram Subramanyam? Professor Ram Subramanyam with, his, with our HSS department. He is a mathematician and he has published lot of information about ancient Indian maths. Generally everybody knows that zero was discovered but it's not. I think his very good book is Beyond Zero. So zero is just a starting point, it's nothing. But far, far better maths was developed on different aspects of mathematics. So the Shalva Sutras, they were much older than what is today known as Pythagoras theorem or the estimation of value of pi. On medicinal size, you can see books in Ayurveda like Sushrut or Charak who have mentioned about various types of surgery which were done. Okay, our book has more details on science and technology. Now the next part is about ethics in economics. Because in ancient India, mention of economics as we discuss today, there was no so much of faculty segmentation. So in the books of economics, you see a lot of ethics related stuff. Because it was believed that if you want to earn money, you should also learn good principles of ethics. Otherwise, you will waste money in a wrong way. So you see a lot of ethics of economics. So it emphasized on higher principles. The objective of agriculture was not just making money. It was also for making available food for everyone. Then apart from human beings, actually all other uh, natural creatures were also to be taken care. And there was a lot of emphasis on earning wealth through proper means. It was not that you don't earn money, you earn a lot of money. Only thing is you earn in a proper way. Uh, this I had referred to about this book by Basham. He has written a lot about Indian businesses at that time. So India had not only a class of luxury living, pleasure seeking people. So there were large number of rich people, though less respected than Brahmins and warriors. So there were people which having lot of wealth and enjoying lot of luxury, but generally they would be less respected. People who have more knowledge would be generally respected more. That's how the balance was maintained. That you earn money, you earn lot of money, but people having knowledge would have more respect. So there will be always incentive to earn more knowledge. And people having more knowledge would generally not chase money. There was no funda of uh, patenting, etc. So you develop knowledge and give it to others. Uh, then code of conduct was there. Uh, these are the different types of businesses. So Gana, Pani, Puga, Vrata, Sangha, Digama and Shreni. Particularly there is very good book by, book rather a thesis by Vikramaditya Khanna which talks about Shreni. Jo last hai, that Shreni was very akin to companies today with having large number of uh, shareholders who would be the owners of that shreni and few people would be managers. The gana se jo chalu hota hai that they are like for tiny or small businesses. But shreni was pretty large of at least thousands of shareholders if not lakhs kind of number. That corporate structure is given by uh, Vikramaditya Khanna who is a professor in US. He has studied in detail about the ancient Indian corporate forms. So there were well developed systems. So you see this during Megasthenes time and also in Arthashastra, how the prices were regulated or details given about weights to be used and how those weights should be standardized and so on. There are also mentions by Marco Polo where he talks about fair conduct by Indian trade, tradesmen and so on. So superior society backed by economic prosperity. So here I was talking about not having a patenting regime because restricting knowledge was considered as evil. You develop knowledge and it should be put in public domain. 
a sort of open architecture kind of system anybody can come and see because taking that the next person can develop a better one not that the other person has to start from scratch this sunderland is another uh, american author who has written about the wealth created by hindus vast and varied industries and how it was much superior than america or europe at that time now this last part is about how the destruction happened during british time because data shows that we had a share of 18% till british has arrived and then suddenly it went down to 3% so this is called as drain of wealth theory particularly a book is written by dada bhai nauroji known as drain of wealth where he has mentioned in different ways how britishers took away the wealth from india one as a part of government because almost all the costs of all wars or all bureaucracy of england to be paid by india also as regulators of trade where they put in lot of taxes on indian goods indian manufacturing and almost nil taxes for goods coming from england so the markets were captured by britishers the industry was destroyed it went on happening parallelly for 100 years that you don't allow indian uh, domestic industry make the imports free develop infrastructure which will make more exports possible like railways or ships exports only of raw items because local industry hai nahi so you can't export manufacture items so exports of raw material so as regulators as well as as policy makers and as also as a government how the loot happened so poverty and the un british that is one more book and there were other authors also like rc dutta and mg ranade who have written about how the drain of wealth happened so dada bhai nauroji if you read in detail he has given annual estimation of wealth growing out each year as well this is also good book by rc dutta about economic history of india economic history in india particularly about the british period this is the quote by one of the britishers only so i have kept it here where this john sullivan president of board of revenue madras he writes that our system acts like a sponge drawing up all good things from the banks of ganges and squeezing them down on the banks of thames it's what he has written Uh, so what we have discussed was mainly about the economy in ancient india now we'll go to the next part ki itna sab hai to why it was not documented and why it is generally not known even till today now only of late slightly few things are being written one is how indians themselves view and how world viewed at india especially from the economy and business part of it so for that the references of marx and max weber are very important who was max weber if you have written ob read something on ob you will get his name psychology ob sociology etc uh, okay we'll first see about marx marx i hope you all would have heard that he has written das kapital before that he wrote a couple of articles about india and he said that economically if you look at the country every village is a economic unit a tariff unit it does not import and export anything ye thoda recent times ka bol raha hai recent means not recent from today's context but about 1750s or so it produces and consumes making the producer the consumer as well and there is no economic inequality because no one has any power over others this is very important because he himself is acknowledging because generally remember that marx means wo acha nahi likhega he has criticized european society a lot he has criticized india also we'll come to next slide but as far as the stability of indian economy is concerned he says that they are self surviving sustaining villages this was called a primitive socialism in the communist terminology if you remember in my first ppt we have seen that step by chart of communism it starts with primitive communism the uh, socialism end is with the communism so he says that indian society has good amount of equality 
and self developed villages so that is a primitive socialism in the second part he has criticized india heavily now he says that there is something wrong with the society because they worship monkeys and cows in his eyes he says that he considered man as a sovereign of nature so in the western philosophy human beings have right to exploit everybody whereas in india you are considering everybody as reward particularly monkeys and cows this is what he attacks and then he says that he accuses hindus of degrading that man by worship of nature so because you worship nature you are a primitive society because earlier part mein wo khud hi bol raha hai ki this is a good society self surviving hai and thus a backward society can never progress and carry out a revolution which is necessary for advancement of human race now we don't even have to study this it doesn't have many lot of data or anything but why it's important because this thought process has impacted our academicians a lot and through their eyes we see india today that's why we should understand ki why our academicians also felt in the same manner and we as educated indians also to an extent feel the same thing because their marks felt that this society cannot progress because they river uh, nature now in the further part he concludes that it is necessary to destroy the social base which will be a painful destruction but it is pleasurable so this is one problem where good amount of philosophers or academicians in india always feel that anything indian is not great indian culture doesn't have any great thing to offer especially those who are more of a marxist kind of mindset the second the second important contribution is by weber now western anthropology is founded on methodological individualism which does not give much importance to family and society so you have a state and as a individual unit you have got individuals every economic human being whereas in india family and society have a very strong role that was one of the reasons they considered india as a very primitive society when i say they here dono groups there was one marxist group other was a capitalist group now we'll come to capitalist group so another person max weber he is a german philosopher he is less known but he is very powerful social thinker now he has wrote a book on hinduism and buddhism and he says that these two societies particularly china and india they can never come up because they believe in karma and rebirth which is anti enterprise anti entrepreneurial development and so these societies can never develop actually he has never studied hindu dharma in detail so he doesn't know much about karma philosophy but he puts the blame on this philosophy ki because you are thinking about karma you will not be entrepreneurial so generally the westernized capitalist outlook continues to be dominated by what marx weber initially wrote main ekdam initial philosophers ki baat kar raha hu then several authors kept on putting the same line in different words using different data but the line of thinking was because indian society or indian mindset believes in karma and rebirth it can't be entrepreneurial or it can't uh, really have money making as an important activity now in 70s first time did goes question india and china were continued to be undeveloped societies but japan became an economic power which westerners could not digest because in their eyes hindu or buddha society can never have a economic prosperity but europe was not able to compete japan in 70s and japan was coming up like anything so that was the first time this question came that how could japan a buddhist country from asia develop as otherwise they always used to feel that asian countries cannot come up or develop at any point of time now it's very important to note that both these philosophers karl marx and weber they never visited india and they did not had much expertise to write on india despite that modern west is rooted in weber's concept of methodological 
individualism that saw society as a collection of individuals rather than individuals as components of society so since every individual is independent on that basis the whole of whole concept is built on that basis the capitalism is built that's why the capitalist societies always look down at societies like india or kafi saal tak unko justification bhi tha because we were actually very poor countries only after 70s initially japan then china and now india are coming up so they are sort of forced to rethink on their assumptions otherwise they always continue to go on their assumptions jiske development nahi hone ke bahut sare aur reasons honge drain of wealth etc but anyway as at that time if the country is not developed people can easily put for their hypothesis so communism generally believed in social engineering and this is also one of the reasons why indian society was disliked because indian society was very strong and it was not allowing the revolutionary changes which communists had conceptualized because change karna indian society ka bahut tough hai society and philosophy uh, i mean the society as well as family is very strong now you might have heard of this term hindu rate of growth this actually happened in 1978 when there was professor raj krishna he was on planning commission and he was very close to nehru before that up to 60s etc so in 1978 on a global forum he was asked question as why india is not able to develop remember other countries which became free at the same time like south korea etc had already started developing a lot so first 10 20 years nobody asked this question but in 78 now like more than 40 years have close to 40 years are over so he was asked ki why india is not growing or is growing so slowly he had no answer so suddenly he said that it's a hindu rate of growth putting all the blame on hindu hindu dharma actually now it has changed it's now considered as a socialist rate of growth because we were following socialist policies all the time there was nothing hindu to comment on but just he made a remark and that remark came in the textbooks as if it's a great thought out <laughs> remark or something uh, dr ambedkar has written a lot about ancient indian economy so so much he has written that i thought it's good to keep it as a separate pp rather than mixing up with those resources uh, generally he is presented only as a social reformer or somebody who is a leader of the lists etc but actually he was economist by training and has written a lot on economics particularly on ancient india i think you would have known about his uh, career but particularly his first thesis and that to presented to columbia university in 1915 is on ancient indian commerce the next one is about also about uh, indian uh, economy especially in british times this national dividend of india and the next is about provincial finance in british india and 1927 is about the problem of rupee you might have read that where he has recommended demonetization he said that it should be done every 10 years but now it was done after 70 years very long time so i have tried to put a few parts of his thoughts uh, he has written a very good essay titled as buddha or karl marx in 1956 where he has mentioned that time he had adopted buddhism this is very i mean towards his many deceased very last part of his life his remarks are very interesting he says that russians are proud of their communism but they forget that the wonder of all wonders is that the buddha established communism so far as the sangha was concerned without dictatorship it may be that it was communism on a very small scale but it was communism without dictatorship a miracle which lenin could lenin failed to do so buddha's method was different it was about changing the mindset so the point is there was no force in buddhist philosophy or in indian philosophy in general whereas the communists try to bring equality by force it has to have a dictatorship kind of regime it has been claimed that communist dictatorship in russia has wonderful achievements to its credit there can be no denial of it 
सी 1956 में कितना हवा है लोगों को लगता है कि सोवियत यूनियन इज रियली प्रोग्रेसिंग विच फ्रूड आफ्टर थर्टी फोर्टी ईयर्स लेटर दैट दैट वॉज ऑल्सो जस्ट अ बलून बट एट दैट टाइम ही सेज दैट देर इज नो डिनाइल दैट दे हैव वंडरफुल अचीवमेंट्स डिस्पाइट दो अचीवमेंट्स दे आर अचीवमेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ मटेरियल अर्निंग्स और अ डेवलप नेशन जो अचीवमेंट्स ही क्वेश्चनेबल है बट एट दैट टाइम ही सेज दैट ओके डिस्पाइट दैट दे इज नो आर्ग्यूमेंट फॉर परमानेंट डिक्टेटरशिप एंड ह्यूमैनिटी डज नॉट वॉन्ट इकोनॉमिक वैल्यूज इट ऑल्सो वॉन्ट स्पिरिचुअल वैल्यूज टू बी रिटेन एंड परमानेंट डिक्टेटरशिप हैज पेड नो अटेंशन टू स्पिरिचुअल वैल्यूज so last part he says that communist philosophy seems to be equally wrong for the aim of their philosophy seems to be fatten pigs as though men are no better than pigs so while indian philosophy talks about material development along with spiritual development uh, communist philosophy essentially only talks about earning more money that's what he has tried to put these are actually his words i have just copied the para yeah this is also very interesting you would have heard that french revolution talks about fraternity liberty and equality so he says that communism can only give one of them that is equality it cannot give the other two whereas indian philosophy or dharma will give you all the three And he has also written about who were shudras where he has specifically mentioned that they were one of the aryan communities and there was no separate varna like a shudra they were a part of kshatriya varna because if you read vedas there are only three varnas which are mentioned only after invasions etc you have the fourth varna like shudras the rise of islam and the expansion of western europe so you would know that there was lot of land trade from india to europe passing through what is today iran iraq turkestan etc or turkey so there were many routes silk route thoda famous there were three four routes but all of them essentially pass through eastern europe obviously because india is on the eastern side so ye jo venice italy wagaira ye sare locations hai they were trade locations because the trade pass through from india india had lot of prosperity and industrial products it had to pass through eastern europe jaise muslim invasion hua of arabia and then of uh, turkey etc the land routes were all blocked and land route blocked ho gaya western europe had now no way to trade with india trade with india was so important that they had no way to trade with india so then they started thinking of sea route उसके बाद उन्होंने मरी टाइम ट्रेड ट्रेड नहीं बोल सकते एटलीस्ट पहले शिपिंग डेवलप किया उसके बाद शिपिंग डेवलप किया एंड को इंसिडेंटली दे फाउंड अमेरिका एज दे ट्राई टू गो टुवर्ड्स ईस्ट टुवर्ड्स वेस्ट टू रीच इंडिया दे फाउंड अमेरिका देन दे आल्सो फाउंड सी रूट टू इंडिया वाया अफ्रीका दैट वॉज अ टाइम एक्चुअली वेस्टर्न यूरोप कूड एक्सपांड लेटर ऑन दे मेड colonies everywhere in africa etc that that is a starting point this is in nutshell i am trying to say tell what he has said then uh, his 2015 thesis is on ancient indian commerce which we have just seen in the other slides but here there are many other mentions so he has said that hardly any civilization existed outside india so he has also given details about each type of activity like agriculture trade manufacturing and so on so this is very interesting that farmers had highest level of faith and uh, have a highest level of respect particularly independent land holder was regarded respectfully but to work on other capitalist farms was not considered as good activity and there was great deal of cooperation amongst the villagers for building and repairing roads tanks municipal buildings and so on that's why we despite minimum level of governance all these things could come up he has also written a lot about how the devotion to cow was helpful for the farming and such activities the second part was about organization of labor industry and commerce 
now one very important part he has said that to the credit of hindus that slavery played a very little role in their economic life remember in other parts of the world slavery is very common he is writing about that time where he has said that capture judicial punishment voluntary self degradation and death were the four principal causes why people could become slaves but it was not common and it was not perpetual kind of slavery ki ek community ne dusre ko capture kiya to the other community is always slaves that's what there in other parts of the world here it was not so then here interestingly he has mentioned about various industrial classes one of them is vaddaki these are various carpenters ship builders cart makers architects and so on but these look like various metal items from iron to uh, gold silver work and so on maybe it was more of a uh, pot making it would be more of very small activity here it is he is talking about industrial activity this is very important from management perspective that there was considerable degree of organization which was found there in small villages and also in cities so the way you have specialized streets in the modern cities they were there in the ancient india also 